welcome from Kegworth Baptist Church online service. This morning our service is going to be brought to us by the Goodwin family. So let's introduce ourselves. Obviously my name's Gail and welcome from Kegworth. Good morning from Wadamie. Good morning from Swatham. Hello Kegworth Baptist Church. This is Gail's Auntie Carol sending you love, hope and faith from Guernsey. This morning, our service is a communion service, um, which will be led by my mum, Sue. So if you'd like to get yourself some bread and wine or a juice and a biscuit, please do join with us later this morning in communion all together. Just to let you know what's coming up in the church diary this week, we have the Zoom online prayer meeting at 10 a.m. on Friday morning. If you'd like to be a part of that, please get in contact with us and we can send you a Zoom invitation. We're really hoping that we will be reopening church for services in church in a few weeks' time, but we'll bring you more on that next week as with government guidelines. Equally, we're also hoping to carry on with an online presence as we've had such a great response to our online services and we don't want to lose our online following as we go into church. So we will keep you updated in all of that. We're now going to start this morning's service with the hymn, The Power of Your Love. Lord, I come to you, let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from
Good morning to you all. I'm Sue and I'm Gail's mum and I'm speaking to you on a beautifully sunny day in Swatham in Norfolk. I'm a deacon at Swatham Baptist Church and would like to we send our love to you all at Kegworth Baptist Church and our very good wishes. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for being with us throughout this past week. We thank you for your support, for your encouragement and your leading, Lord, through this past week. When we may have been concerned, we may have been anxious, we may have been worried. We thank you, Lord, that we know that you walk with us always. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty of your creation. We thank you, Father, for the beauty of the hedgerows, for the sunshine, for the colours, Lord, for the different colours of green in the trees and the hedgerows. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for birdsong. And Lord, even on grey days, we can still see beauty within your world. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of your creation. Lord, we pray for all you and thank you for all you have done for churches, Lord, throughout this country and the world. How you've actually helped them, Lord, to bring services to their fellowships. Lord, we look forward to the things that you have planned for your church. We thank you, Lord, and look forward. We pray that you will help us to look forward with excitement for what you are yet to do in the future, Lord, within your church family. Father God, we bring now those who are saddened by the loss of loved ones. Father God, we just pray that you will hold them close and give them your peace. And Lord, we now come to you in a moment of silence to bring those who are upon our hearts. Lord, I bring to you those people who have been waiting patiently for operations, who have had to be postponed, Lord, through the, due to the COVID virus. We pray now, Lord, that as things begin to get a little bit better, that they will be able to have operations scheduled for them and that that will help to relieve their anxiety. Lord, I thank you so much and we thank you, Lord, for the, for the blessing of the outpouring of vaccines, Lord, that so many people have now been able to receive two vaccinations and so many younger people have been able to have their first vaccine. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for the NHS, for doctor's surgeries. We thank you for volunteers helping. We thank you, Lord, for all the different facilities made available so that vaccines can be given to as many people as possible. We do so pray, Lord, that those who are fearful will come to understand that it is a good thing for them to have the vaccine and also for others, Lord. And so I pray that you will quiet their hearts and help them as they make that decision to come forward for a vaccine. Lord, we thank you for the manufacturers of the vaccines and the new ones that are now being, being brought forward. Father God, we thank you that we are in an area where we can have vaccine, but we pray, Lord, that um, vaccines will be made available to the poorest countries of the world, especially in the Southern Hemisphere. We pray, Lord, that before too long, they will also be able to receive vaccines to keep them well. Lord, we pray for our government. We pray that you will be within our government, with the Christians within our government, praying, Lord, 
for the good leadership of the government, Lord, that they will look to the best interests of the people that they are there to serve, Father God. And Lord, we pray for the many countries around the world that have wars and attacks and just leaving people very vulnerable. We pray for these, Lord. We pray for these countries. We pray for the innocent people who are caught in the crossfire. And Father God, we pray that your peace will cover these areas. We pray, Lord, that you will give those that are caught in the crossfire hope, Lord, and that you will protect them. And we just pray, Father God, that your peace will surround these areas of conflict. And Lord, we, you created us to be in community. We pray, Father God, that you will help us within our own communities to serve you, to serve others, and to make people feel welcome and part of a local community. And so, Lord, we pray for churches in this country and all over the world, that they will be salt and light shining for you, Lord, Haggai 2 verses 1 to 9. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtal, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all of the people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord God Almighty says. In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Thanks be to God. Good morning from Maputo in Mozambique. It's fantastic to be with you this morning and thank you so much for inviting me to share some thoughts with you on this passage from Haggai chapter 2 verse 1 to 9. So just to give us some context before we dig into this this text this morning. Haggai is a small book, as we know, that comes towards the end of the, the Old Testament. And, and as we know, the Old Testament is this amazing, long, rich narrative that talks and shows us about God's love and faithfulness and compassion for his people. And throughout the different books, God is calling and leading his people into the fullness of the plans and promises and, and life in all its fullness that God has for them. And throughout the different stories and the different generations, we see the people, <laughs> so they follow God and then they think they know better and they try and go their own way and it ends in, in, in disaster and then they come back to God and it's this amazing narrative. And so, for example, God leads them out of uh, slavery in Egypt, they go through, God leads them through the wilderness and into the promised land and they they build these incredible cities and King David has this great empire and then his son Solomon builds this amazing temple to God so that God's presence can dwell in it and, and Jerusalem becomes this incredible city of power and prosperity and influence and it has this amazing temple as its centerpiece. And so they, they start living into the, the plans and promises of God but they keep going their own way and they keep uh, um, trying to go and do their own 
live life in their own way, thinking that they know better than God and God keeps warning them and saying, no, don't go your own way. It leads to destruction. My way is life. Your way is is not the best way. But they don't listen. And unfortunately, that leads to um, uh, the Babylonian army invades Jerusalem, destroys the city and takes the people into exile as slaves. So the city is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, the people of God are taken into exile as slaves. Again, they return to slavery in a different place in Babylonia this time. And Jerusalem is left in ruins. And this goes on for around 70 years. But God is faithful and he never gives up on his people and he is he's full of love for them. So he creates a way for them to come back. And the king of Persia gives permission for a remnant of the people to leave slavery and and go back to or leave slavery in Babylonia and go back to Jerusalem. And that's where we pick up in Haggai, in the book of Haggai, um, Zerubbabel and Joshua and a remnant of the people have come back from Babylonia, back so they've been let given a level of freedom from slavery to come back to the city that was once this powerful, amazing city with an incredible temple. And they come back to it after years of 70 years of oppression and slavery. So they've been beaten down and they come back into this city that's in ruins and they need to to build a life there again. And in chapter one, we hear that when they first got back, they were really concerned about themselves and what am I going to eat and where am I going to live? So they start focusing on building their own house and about building their own houses and planting crops. And God sends Haggai to challenge them and say, oh, you're going your own way again. Like you need to follow me and my vision. So start by building the temple and, and honouring me and then we'll, we'll rebuild will rebuild from there. Stop trying to do things in your own way. So they start rebuilding the temple in chapter one and in chapter two, where we find them now, they're about a month into to rebuilding the temple in this city that's in ruins and trying to rebuild what was once a spectacular temple from the rubble that they're that they're living in. So you may well ask, why on earth are you sharing on this passage today? Like I'm sure you're 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 in Kegworth thinking, my word, we've got enough going on. We're in a global pandemic. We've got we've got a lot going on. It's an interesting story, but why is it relevant to to us? And I think even though this happened 2,500 years ago in a distant land, I think it's super relevant to where we are today. Really, for four key reasons. The first reason is God is speaking to these people at a time when they have been through a prolonged and pervasive crisis that affected everybody in their work. Their whole world was rocked, their whole society from princes to peasants. Their city was destroyed. Everything that they put their hope and their strength and their identity in, everything that their plans and their thoughts about the future was in was destroyed. It was taken from them. They were taken as slaves into exile and they lost everything. It's a They've been through a crisis where the losses were immeasurable. So that's the first thing. They've been through a prolonged and pervasive crisis. And the peak, secondly, the peak of that past, that crisis, has now passed. They've been through the slavery and the exile and they've now got a bit of freedom. They're going back into the world and back to Jerusalem to rebuild. But but it's not the Jerusalem that they left. It's not the Jerusalem of years ago, of the glory years. This is a Jerusalem that's been that's been ravaged by war and, and left in, in desolation. And it's it's not the it's not the old world. This is their new reality. The impact of that crisis is very real. And that's where they're stood now. The peak has passed, but they're in the consequences of that crisis. They're in the impact of that crisis and they have to learn to live in that new normal. So that's the second thing. So they've been through a prolonged and pervasive crisis. They're now having to come to terms with a new normal where the peak of the crisis has passed, but the but the normal has changed, their reality has changed. And then thirdly, they have to rebuild. God is calling them to rebuild. He's saying your destiny is not to live among this rubble and this ruin. There's a future for you, but you have to do the work and start rebuilding. And it's a rebuilding that happens at several levels. Like Zerubbabel is representing leadership and influence. Joshua is representing the priesthood and the church. And then God is also speaking to all the people of the land, everybody that's there. So it's saying this rebuilding is also a universal work that we all have a part to play in. 
And then finally, so they've got they've been through a prolonged and pervasive crisis, which involved a lot of loss and shook their whole world and their identity. The peak of that crisis has passed, but they're now in the in the result of that crisis. So they've lost a lot. They're in the kind of the ruins of what they 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 once thought was their future. They now need to rebuild and they need to do that together and understand what their respective roles are. And then finally, God is talking to them at this at this moment that they need a vision. If you're building anything, you need a vision of what that is going to look like when you finish it. And God is saying to them, I have a vision for you. This is not the end of the story. This rubble, this ruins, this rebuilding is not the end of the story. I have a vision for your life and for your future and I have a plan for you and it is better than you can imagine. So they've been through crisis, the peak has passed, but they're dealing with the impact of it. They're having to start the work of the slow grinding work of rebuilding and they need a new vision. God is giving them a new vision for the future. And I think that speaks powerfully to where we are right now in our lives in this pandemic age. We have been through as a world, as a nation in the UK, as a community in Kegworth, as a church, in your life, in your family, We've been through a time of prolonged crisis, 18 months or so, so far, not 70 years, thankfully. Let's pray it doesn't go on that long. But we've been through a time of crisis. People's worlds have been rocked by this to different degrees, but there has been a huge amount of loss. People have lost loved ones. They've lost jobs. They've lost things that their identity and their worth was tied up in. People have had to face fears that they never imagined. People's health has been impacted. People's emotional and mental health has been uh, damaged through this time. Huge levels of anxiety and fear. We've been through a time of collective and pervasive and prolonged crisis that has affected everyone. No one has been immune of this. So God is speaking to a people that have been through crisis in this passage and he's speaking to us. We're coming out of a time of real crisis. And just as for the people of Israel at that point, the worst of that peak of the crisis seems to have passed. They're coming out of slavery and exile back into the freedom of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is not like it was. And that's like now, it seems and we hope and we pray that the worst of this pandemic has passed in the UK, certainly we hope, and you're getting more freedom and you're able to leave your houses, you're not in lockdown anymore, you're going back into Jerusalem, back into the world, but the world is not the same as it was before and we're having to cope with some of the things of the past now seem to be in ruins. The people that we've lost are no longer there the jobs and the security that we had might have been shaken. Our our fortitude and our resilience might be damaged. For all of us, there are things in our lives that are feeling like they're in ruins right now. And, and, and that's our new reality and we have to learn how to live with that. So just as God was talking to them in the ruins and the rubble of Jerusalem, God is speaking to us now in the areas of our lives that we feel might have been destroyed or damaged by the crisis that we've passed through. Thirdly, the rebuilding. The people, God was calling the people of Israel to rebuild uh, Jerusalem. He was calling his people to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple first and foremost. And that's what we're being called to do now. We need to rebuild. Our destiny is not to live in the rubble or the, the areas of where we're feeling lost right now. We're being called to rebuild our lives and to find a new vision and a new future. And that connects to to the three levels that I mentioned in terms of leadership and at an individual level, we all have influence in our lives and the people around us. And it's about what is God calling us to do? How are we being called to contribute to that rebuilding? Who are we able to, what is our influence and how is God calling us to use it in our families, in our church, in our work? And then at the level of um, the church, Joshua represents the high priest. As a church, we're being called to think about what is God, what's God's purpose for us in this rebuilding? Because now God doesn't dwell in temples, God dwells in our hearts, his spirit is within us, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so what is God's purpose for us as individuals and as the collective church in terms of this rebuilding post-pandemic? And what's God's vision for the church in this time? And then all the people of the land, it says in this, he's talking to all the people of the land. And it's we need to recognise that everybody was impacted. Everybody around us is rebuilding something in their lives right now. And we need to have grace and love and work together to help each other rebuild after this post-pandemic time. And then that fifth, that fourth point, sorry, about having a new vision. 
God is saying to the people of Israel in the rubble, trying to rebuild, he's saying to them, I have a vision for you. I have a purpose and a plan for you. And it is better than what was before. It's so much better than what the best is yet to come. And that's what God's saying to us now as well. God has God always has more for us and better than we can imagine. So we need to be seeking out his vision and, and following him. So I think it's super relevant. And I think there are five key things that we can take from this, that God is, is speaking to the people of Israel and that also speaks to us today. I think, and I'll, I'll unpack each of these in, in, the, in the words of that passage, but just to summarise, the first thing I think this passage says to us is that God speaks to us in the ruins. He knows our hearts. He knows our lowest points. He knows the fears and the things that we don't want to tell anybody. And he speaks to us at the point of our pain. He meets us there and he encourages us to come up out of it. And he ministers into the, the worst of our pain. Firstly, God speaks to us in the ruins. He doesn't wait for us to get out of the ruins and complete the rebuild. He speaks to us at our lowest moments and helps us build back. Secondly, God has a calling in your life during this season. He has a calling upon your life during this season and he has a vision for you beyond your current circumstances. This situation is not the end of the story. God always has more and he's calling you to do something now and he's calling you to a vision that is so much better than you could imagine beyond the current circumstances. So God speaks to us in the ruins. He has a calling on your life in this season and a vision beyond the current circumstances. Thirdly, to be able to push into that vision, to be able to rebuild, we have to keep our eyes on God. We can't let our current circumstances distract us or or our fears limit us. We have to keep our eyes on God and keep following him into his vision and purpose for us. Fourthly, God is faithful and he is always with us. We are never alone. He has promised never to leave us or forsake us and he is with us throughout. And this passage speaks really powerfully to that. So we're not doing this on our own. God is with us. And then fifthly, nothing is impossible to God and the best is always yet to come. This passage is such a voice of encouragement to the people of Israel at that time. And God is saying it's so much better. What is ahead is so much better than even the best times in the past if you trust and follow me. So we can take real encouragement from that. So just to very quickly unpack each of those, those points, as we said, this is uh, the, the first verse says on the 21st day of the seventh month, um, God spoke through Haggai to, to Zerubbabel and Joshua and the people. Now, that day is important just because it's a month. Of, it's about a month after they started. We hear when they started in the first chapter, in the second chapter. This is about a month in. So this is really important because it means God didn't just say you need to start rebuilding the temple and then sit back and watch them do it and then he doesn't talk to them again until they've finished that's not our god our god is with us throughout the journey every step of the way he's with them a month into it when they're starting to tire and when they're starting to really feel overwhelmed god is with them and he purposefully meets them and speaks to them verse three it says who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory how does it look to you now does it not seem like nothing to you does it seem like does it seem to you like nothing? So God's kind of coming alongside them and he goes straight. He doesn't just come alongside and try and encourage them. He comes alongside and he speaks to the heart of their pain at that moment. He knows their hearts. He knows that they're feeling overwhelmed and despondent. They know how beautiful the temple was in the past and they know right now they're just surrounded by rubble and they're not, they're not builders. They don't feel equipped to do this. They're feeling inadequate and overwhelmed and afraid and, and just hopeless at this moment. And God comes to them and he names it and he ministers right into that and says, I know you know what it was like before. I know you probably think this is pretty rubbish at the moment, but he says, but now be strong. And he says it to each of them. Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, people. He says it to all of them. Be strong. This is not the end of the story. God comes alongside them at their most vulnerable and, 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 and downtrodden moment and says, it's OK. Be strong. Keep going. This is not the end of the story. The best is yet to come. And what's wonderful is this is this sentiment is repeated in, in Zechariah 4.10, when God again speaks to Zerubbabel when he's working on this and he says, 
Do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. So he's saying, I know it doesn't look like much right now, but keep going. I am with you. I delight in the work you're doing and the best is yet to come. So I think this speaks to us just to say God speaks to us in the ruins. He speaks to us at our lowest moments in our in our in our deepest fears and our deepest concerns so whatever you're feeling right now if there are areas of your life where you're feeling overwhelmed where you're feeling inadequate where you're feeling like you just can't see a future beyond your current situations God is with you. He knows it. He's not dismissing that pain. He feels that pain with you and he's coming alongside you and saying, be strong. This is not the end of the story. I am with you. Keep going. And the best is yet to come. So firstly, God speaks to us in the in the ruins. Secondly, God has a calling on your life in this season and a vision beyond the current circumstances. So in that verse four, He speaks to them in the ruins. He names the pain they're feeling. And then he says, but now be strong, Zerubbabel, be strong, Joshua, be strong. All the people of this land, declares the Lord, and work for I am with you. So he's saying, keep going, work, keep moving on. I am with you. Verse seven, he says, I will fill this house with glory. Verse nine, he says, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And in this place, I will grant peace. So God is saying, I know, you know, the temple in the past was amazing, but the one you're building, even though it feels pretty rubbish right now, is going to be so much better because I will fill it with my glory and it will surpass your wildest dreams. It's going to knock your socks off what we're going to do together in the future. So he's saying, don't let your current circumstances overwhelm you. I've called you to a work. I will be with you in that work and I will give you the results. You do the work and God will bring the results and it will be beyond what we can ask or imagine. And this resonates with what God says back in Jeremiah 29, 11, when he says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Our current circumstances or the situations of the past do not determine our future. God does. And he has amazing plans for us, no matter how we feel right now. God can do above and beyond what we could ask and imagine. So he is saying, whatever you're facing in your life today, he is saying, be strong and work. I am with you. Be strong and work for I am with you. Be strong, keep going for God, the mighty God is by your side and he will sustain you and support you and deliver you into the fullness of his plans and promises. Three, to reach the fullness of those plans and promises, We need to keep our eyes on God. God meets them in the ruins. He encourages them to be strong and to trust in his vision. And he's, but to be able to keep working, to keep going, to keep persevering in the difficult circumstances, we need to keep focused on God and not let our current situations or our own fear or insecurity or needs or, or, or our own wisdom take over the role that God has. Like I was saying, in that first chapter, God meets them when they're trying to build their own houses and the temple's still in ruin and they're building their own houses and planting their fields. And it's not going very well. They're not making much progress. And God keeps saying to them, give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. You expected to see much, but it turned out to be little. And why is that? And then God says, because my my house is in ruins while you're busy trying to build your own house. He's saying, just don't get distracted about what you think is, is right or priority or keep focused on me and I will lead you into the best that I have for you. And that reminds us of the words from Matthew 6, 33, where where it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So as we keep rebuilding in this season, in our own lives, in our hearts, in our families, in our church, in our society, as we keep trying to understand and follow God's vision, let's keep our eyes on him. Let's keep seeking him first and he will equip us to be strong and work because he is with us. So God speaks to us in the ruins. He has a plan and a purpose for us in this season and a vision beyond our circumstances. Um, 
We need to keep focused on God so that we can realise the fullness of those plans and circumstances. And the great thing is that throughout that, God is faithful and he is always with us. That's our fourth uh, taking from this or my fourth taking from this passage. God is faithful and he is always with us. Verse five says, this is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. He's reminding them right back to when they came out of slavery in Egypt, right up to this current day after they've been in slavery in Babylon, everything that's happened in that meantime. He's saying, I am still faithful to my promise. I am still with you. Do not fear. Our God is a faithful God. He's a powerful God. We don't have to be afraid. He is in control. And that reminds us of what it says in Deuteronomy 31, 6. God is so faithful. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, because the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God keeps promising throughout the Bible that he is with us and that he will never leave us or forsake us. In the New Testament, Jesus says, Matthew 28, 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So in this passage to the Israelites and to us now as we as we coming out of this crisis of the pandemic and we're rebuilding our lives in a new normal and, and seeking God's vision, God is saying, I am with you, I am faithful. Be strong, do not fear, I am with you. He meets us in the ruins, he understands our pain, He's with us, he gives us the vision, he strengthens us to work and he stays with us every single step of the way towards our towards the plans and the promises that he has for us. So be strong, don't be afraid. God is with you today, whatever you're facing. God is a faithful God and with him, nothing is impossible. And that brings us to our final point, the fifth point. Nothing is impossible to God and the best is always yet to come. As it says, in a little while, from uh, from verse 7, I think it says, in a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and what is desired by all the nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant my peace, declares the Lord Almighty. It keeps reminding us that it's the Lord Almighty that's speaking, the God that is bigger than our circumstances. And he's speaking to them in, in the ruins of their former glory. He's speaking to them at a time when they feel beaten down and inadequate. And he's saying, the best is yet to come. You haven't seen anything yet. This passage is so rich and beautiful, but we don't have time to, to go into that in too much detail. But God is saying he will shake the heavens and the earth, the seas and the land. And he can shake them because he made them. He's reminding them that he made everything. He talks about all the silver and gold are mine. It's all the things that they held precious in the past. They came from God. Of course, he can give even more in the future. He says what is desired... Um, that what is desired by all the nations will come. Only God can give what we all desire because only God can satisfy all the desires of our hearts. He says, and I will grant peace. Only God can grant peace because he is the Prince of Peace. He is peace. So he's just reminding them of his sovereignty and his power. And he's reminding us today, whatever we're facing, nothing is impossible to him and the best is always yet to come. When he was talking to the Israelites at this time, when he's talking to his people at this time, he's talking to a broken, hurting, overwhelmed people as they stand in the ruins of everything that they thought was once great. And he is saying, it's OK, the future is going to be better than the past. I've got you. Be strong. Take heart. Keep working because I am with you. Nothing is impossible for me and the best is yet to come, and we're reminded again the words, Lord's, uh, the Lord's words to Zerubbabel in Zechariah four six. He says, "Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit," says the Lord Almighty. We are not in this alone. The God of the universe, the all powerful God, is with us, and He will help us to overcome whatever challenges we're facing as we rebuild after this pandemic. He has a vision. Let's keep our eyes on Him, and let's keep following it. So, to finish. God speaks to us in the ruins. He knows our heart. He knows our pain and he meets us right in that pain and ministers to it. He has a calling on your life or my life in this season. We're not waiting for another time. He has a calling on us now and a vision beyond our current circumstances. This is not the end of the story. 
We need to keep our eyes on God and keep coming back to him and letting him lead us through this. Fourth, he's faithful and he's always with us. He will never leave us and forsake us. We can turn away from him. He never leaves us. So let's just keep our eyes on him and let's keep following. Fifth, nothing is impossible to God and the best is always yet to come. He was saying to the Israelites, this circumstances right here is not the end of the story. There is more to come. There is better to come. So whatever your circumstances are right now, this is not the end of the story. God has so much more for you, for your family, for your church, for your community. So be strong. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Let's seek God's vision as we rebuild. Let's do the work. Let's trust God that the best is yet to come. Thank you so much. God bless. My 
Let's come together now in communion. Let us pray. Lord, we come together to partake in communion, not because we must, but because we may, in our love for Jesus, our Saviour. Please forgive us when we have sinned and fallen short in word, thought and deed. Let us in a moment of quiet come before the Lord as we think of the times when we have fallen short and ask for forgiveness. Jesus met with his disciples to eat the Jewish Passover. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Let us eat the bread. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink together. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice you made on the cross to allow us to have a relationship with you through Jesus. Thank you for your grace and forgiveness when we let you down and help us to honour you with our everyday lives. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Jesus, and we thank you, Holy Spirit, for walking with us and being with us always. Amen.
Thank you, Dawn, for your inspiring message this morning and thank you, Mum, for leading us in communion. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for Dawn's message today and we pray, Lord, that you continue to bless us always. We have no fear with you by our side and we can be strong and courageous in our faith and in our knowledge that love never fails. You are always with us. Lord, we pray for the communities that we've heard from this morning. We pray for everybody at Life Church in Mozambique. We pray for everyone at Swaffham Baptist Church. We pray for everybody at Holy Trinity in Guernsey. And we pray especially, Lord, for our own community here in Kegworth and our online community. May you continue to bless all of our fellowships around the world. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And let us finish this morning by blessing one another with the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. So it just leaves me to say goodbye from Kegworth. Goodbye. It's been lovely joining with you all today and I now have to say bye bye from Sunny Swaffham. Bye. I'm wishing you every blessing as I say goodbye from Carol in St Peter Paul. And we're going to finish this morning's service with the hymn Great is Thy Faithfulness. Have a good week, stay safe and look after one another. Goodbye. See